section of scripture so many times in the past week um, I could almost recite it but I'm going to read it to you again because it's a good section and the reason why I want to give you this particular section is because I want you to see the context of where we're going to go and that's in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 of course in verse 13 we begin where it says I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Of course, that's the great hope of the return that is promised to us, the believer, that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, the dead in Christ will rise, and then we which are alive shall be gathered together into the air and meet them and be with the Lord. Then we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we continue. We continue on the topic of the gathering and what's going to happen after the gathering. So that's your context. First Thessalonians 5 verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So the first thing Paul starts out is by saying what God once said. And what God once said is that the times and the seasons, there's no need to write about it unto you. Times and the seasons. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The New International reads this of verse 1. Now, brothers, about the times and the dates we do not need to write unto you. A lot of people are interested, overly interested, in exactly when the end of the world is going to happen, the rapture is going to happen, and the day of the Lord will begin on the earth. And it's been that way for years and years and years. And Paul's answer is the best we can do. He says, there's no need to write to you about the times or the dates. He says, because there are no times and dates. He said, that he's coming like a thief in the night. And you know what? He says, we see through a glass darkly. And I've taught you many times, that's the best it gets. So you know what? The best it gets, there's no need to write for times and the dates. Because he's coming like a thief in the night. And that's the best it gets as far as the answer with regards to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and all the guessing about the return. Get Acts chapter 1, please. Verse 1. 
verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, Jesus Christ, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1, 6. So what did the apostles want to know? They wanted to know, this all happened, resurrection took place, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Because they knew about the coming kingdom. They knew about the millennial reign. They knew all these things in the Old Testament and what Jesus Christ taught them. And Jesus Christ answers them in verse 7 and he says, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. Now isn't that an amazing answer? You see, because the Bible says it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Who can explain to me why it is that so many people disregard God's will and continue to plow ahead and spend a lifetime trying to figure out and predict the times and the seasons? Some people base their whole entire ministry on it. We're going to watch for the signs that the Lord come back. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know. I call that disobedience. See? We may think we know, or we got an idea about when the Lord's going to return, or maybe we're even pretty sure. But you know what? People thought they knew. They had an idea, and they've been pretty sure for centuries. And you know what? Every one of them was wrong. You know why every one of them was wrong? Because it's not for them to know. And they disregard God's will and go ahead and say, oh, we're going to know anyway. If Jesus said it's not for you to know, then what? It's not, it's not for you to know. Well, I don't care what you say, Jesus. I'm going to find out. I don't think so. It doesn't happen like that. In the end, God's going to send Jesus Christ back when he's good and ready. And that's his business. It doesn't have to be ours. All we have to be is faithful and ready. That's for us to know, and that's what we're what encouraged to do. He talks about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And what the day of the Lord is, is a period of time in the future where God will judge the earth. Now, this is taught, presented many times in the Old Testament. I'm just going to give you one verse, then I'll reference some more if you want to do some work and look them up for yourself. In Isaiah 13, verse 9, this is what the scripture says. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. He's talking about the future. It's going to come. Cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. 13 verse 11. And I, the Lord, will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. See, this is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a future period of time in which God will be at work in world affairs more directly and dynamically than he has been since the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. It's a time referred to and prophesied in many Old Testament scriptures. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 32, Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, Zephaniah 3, verses 14 through 15, and many, many others throughout the Old Testament. These and other Old Testament verses indicate that the day of the Lord will include both judgment and blessing. The day of the Lord begins immediately after the rapture of the church and increasingly gets worse and ends with the conclusion of the millennial kingdom. Now go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
1 Thessalonians 5. Now we read in verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. A thief in the night. Verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with the trial, and they shall not, what? Escape. Escape. If the water breaks, you know what's coming next? A baby. And ain't nothing you can do about it. And that's what he's saying. That's the way the day of the Lord's coming. Once it starts, it's coming. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't stop it. You can't send a nuclear missile against it. You can't send a delegation for a peace treaty. See? You can't throw billions of dollars at it. Once it starts... It's coming. Verse 4. But ye, brethren. Okay. He said it's going to come. Now he says, but ye, brethren. What are brethren? Brethren are born again believers. He's talking to brothers and sisters in Christ. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It doesn't say a day. It doesn't say any day. The context says that that day should overtake you. See? You, brethren, you're not in darkness that that day, what day? The day of the Lord should overtake you. See? This is the second time it mentions a thief should overtake you like a thief. In other words, you won't be surprised. It's not going to overtake you. Do you know what a surprise party is? Right? You know what you do when you have a surprise party? What's the most important thing about a surprise party? That it's what? Surprise. It's a surprise. <laughs> and you do everything in your power to keep it what? Surprise. A surprise. That's right. It's a surprise party. The point is this, nobody knows when the thief is going to come. It's a surprise. He overtakes you. He tricks you. He fools you. If you knew when the thief was going to come, would the, th would the thief come? No. Because he wouldn't be a surprise. He wouldn't be a thief. He wouldn't trick you. And that's the way the day of the Lord's going to come. Nobody knows when the day of the Lord is going to come. All we know is that it's going to come. And you know what else we know? It's not for you to know the times and the seasons. That's from the mouth of Jesus Christ. Okay. Luke chapter 12 verse 39 says this. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what, our, what hour the thief would come, he would have what? He watched. And had not suffered his house to be broken through. Nobody knows. See, if we know when the day of the Lord's going to come, we could be prepared. If there was a way of finding out when the day of the Lord is going to come, we could watch for it and be prepared. But you know what? There's no signs. There's no seasons. There's no definite nothing when the day of the Lord's coming, except... It's coming like a thief in the night. You know what that means? You don't know when it's coming and nobody else knows. Not here on earth anyway. See, all of heaven may know, but they ain't saying nothing. He went and suffered his house to be broken through. But ye therefore, be they therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you what? Think not. You think not. You think, no, we got all these people out here thinking about, oh, it's this and oh, it's that and oh, it's the other thing. Well, you know what? I can tell you one thing. It's not that time. Because the Bible says it's what they ain't thinking. And yet, they go on and on and on and on and on. Because okay? they ignore the word. 1 
1 Thessalonians 5. Back to it again. Verse 5. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. Who's he talking to? The brethren, the born-again believers. The ones he just told about the rapture in the preceding chapter. The one he just told that the day of the Lord's coming like a thief in the light and nobody a thief in the night and nobody knows. That's who he's talking to, the brethren. You are the children of the light and the children of the day. We, he includes himself, are not of the night nor of darkness. See? We used to be of darkness, but now we're of light. Ephesians 5 8 says. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord, walk as children of light. And that's a good thing to remember. You used to be darkness. So don't be so critical about people who are in the darkness. Okay? Remember where you came from. Don't be judgmental about them. Help them. Love them. Be compassionate towards them. Verse 5, once again, you are all the children of light. <clears throat> you are all what? All, everybody are all with distinction. All with distinction. The believers are the children of light. And the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Here in this verse you see the contrast between the true God and the devil. Many times in the Bible, the words light and day are used by a figure to represent God and his truth and the things that are good and the things that are right and the things that bring light. Likewise, many times in the Bible, the words darkness and night are used figuratively to describe the devil and evil and that which is wrong and the lies that Satan fills the world with. Here he says, we're not of the night, we're of the day, we're of the light. There's a comparison there. You have children of light, children of the day, and then you have, we're not of the night, nor of the darkness. Verse 6. Therefore, because we're the children of the day, we're children of light, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober. Now the New International translates this verse this way. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert is the word watch. Let us be alert and self-controlled. Self-controlled. And self-controlled is really a better translation of the Greek word because sober in our day and in our time, we associate that with drinking, and with getting high, this sort of thing. But God requires of us more than just being sober, not drinking and not getting high. He requires us to have self-control. And if you have self-control, you have self-control over drinking. You have self-control over stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Well, what else do you need self-control over? Emotions. Because sometimes your emotions all get whatever and you go nuts. <clears throat> but God says you should have self-control over that. Anger. You should have self-control over your anger because you get angry and then people go nuts. They do stupid things. See? The word says, don't sleep like others do, but be alert and have self-control. Self-control. The New Jerusalem says it this way. We should not go on sleeping as everyone else does, but stay wide awake and sober. We should not go on sleeping as everyone else does. I, I was thinking about this today, and I want to tell you this so you understand it, because this is the God's honest truth. You have an accurate knowledge of God's Word, okay? You do. You've been taught the truth. If you've learned it and you study it and you walk the truth, 
And I want to tell you this. You have more common sense and more brains than any PhD on the planet when it comes to God's Word. Any philosopher, any diplomat, even these politicians that talk flowery and they have wonderful vocabulary and they got PhDs and they're lawyers, you know what? They know nothing compared to you and the truth of the way things should be on this earth. The youngest believer is worth more to God than the oldest unbeliever with all the knowledge in the world. They keep making programs, they keep passing <coughs> bills, they keep coming up with these harebrained schemes to try to fix something that they don't have the ability to fix. They don't have the ability to fix. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. According to the scripture, they laugh at it and say it's foolishness. They laugh at the answer to their problems. See? So if that light that is in you is dark, how dark is that darkness? See the way the devil twisted it? They don't have spiritual eyes. They don't have <clears throat> spiritual understanding. They don't understand that every time they make a rule and a regulation that cuts across God's word, they cut their own throat. They bring themselves closer to judgment. They bring our nation closer to destruction. They bring the world and make it a worse place. I don't care how many windmills you build. It's not going to fix the problem. Man is the problem and his rebellion and his arrogance against God. That's the problem. And you know what? They thumb their nose at God. They mock God. But you know what God says? Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also what? Reap. 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 And you know what? The great reaper is? He's coming in the day of the Lord. And you're not going to escape the great reaper. The Bible says in Isaiah that man is going to be worth more than gold and so rare. You know what that means? That means that the men that are going to survive during the tribulation period are going to be very few. Sparse, like gold. That's what it means. You know why? Because God's coming to judge them. God's coming to take care of things. See? Listen. Verse 7. For they that sleep Sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. It's not talking about drink, drunk, that alcohol. It's talking about spiritually drunk. Let us who are of the day be sober. Put it on the breastplate of faith. The breastplate protects your heart. And out of your heart are the issues of life. And if your heart is faint, you're in big trouble. you got to put that breastplate on. Keep in the Word. Stay in the Word. Admonish yourself with like-minded believers that are going to build you up in the Word. Give you the Word. See? The world's not going to give you the Word. The world is going to beat you up and tear you down. That's why I tell you, don't watch the stupid news. That's the devil's way of into your life. They tell you all the horrible things. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. It says it's the hope of salvation. See, no one realizes salvation right now. All we have is the promise of salvation. We have the hope of salvation. Nobody, no born again Christian, no one has salvation now where it's realized. Salvation comes at the resurrection or the gathering, which is part of the gathering. That's when salvation will be realized. That's when you overcome death, when the dead in Christ rise first, and when you're in the kingdom. Then your salvation will be realized. Right now, our salvation isn't realized. It's a promise. It's a hope. But you know what? The Bible says it's appointed on the man what? Wants to die. People who have salvation right this second and full amount of a station don't die. It's the hope of salvation. It's the promise of a God who cannot lie.
Amen. That's why it's good is done. See? And that's why it's a prophetic perfect. He speaks of it like it's all, already done because it's the God who does it. Now look at verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath. Yes. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back. He didn't appoint us to wrath. What are we talking about? We're talking about the day of the Lord. We're talking about it coming like a thief in the night. We're talking about we're not of the night. We're of the day. And then we get to this verse where it says God has not appointed us to wrath. Wrath is part of the day of the Lord. When things increasingly get worse. The wrath of the Lord comes upon the earth. I read it to you out of Isaiah. But that is not your appointment. You go there, you say, I got a nine o'clock appointment. So no, you don't. <laughs> that guy over there who didn't call him the name of the Lord it got a nine o'clock appointment, maybe. But you just take the elevator up. You see? You're not appointed to that time, that period of time. And and, and the word tells you so many places. That he saved you from that. That you, you don't have that. And yet, they read it, and they misinterpret it, and they teach people, like, you got to do this, you got No, 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 you know. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. You are not appointed to the raft, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. You see how that refers back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Wake would be those of us which remain. Sleep would be the ones that died in Christ and rise first. And he covers both categories. He says whether you wake or whether you sleep, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, whether you are dead in Christ rise first or whether we which are alive are gathered together, whether we wake or sleep, we're going to what? Live together with him. Now look at this. Verse 11. Wherefore, what? Comfort, Comfort yourselves. yourselves together and edify one another, even as you what? Also. Comfort themselves in what? Okay? What's the comfort? That the Lord's going to come back. You're going to drop the day of the Lord on us. The Christians are going to have to stay on here on earth. They're going to go through the tribulation. They're going to see the flesh burn. They're going to see all these people die. There's going to be millions of this. There's going to be big bugs carrying us off, stinking us off. And where it's supposed to comfort. Isn't that a wonderful comfort? That that's what you have to look forward to? See, but that's what they want you to believe. That's not what the Word teaches. There's no comfort in that. That scare you. You understand? Your comfort is that God had not appointed you to that raft. You're getting out of here. The Lord's gathering you together before that stuff can happen. That's your comfort. You understand? It ends the same way that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18 ended. What's it say? Wherefore... Comfort one another with what? These words. These words. Verse 11 of chapter 5 says, Wherefore, comfort yourself together. He tells you twice, take it easy. Be of good cheer. Comfort yourself. The Lord's coming back. He's going to take care of you. He's going to do all these things. You're going to get the dead in Christ up first, and we with your life are going to meet him. You're not appointed unto wrath. Don't worry about when the day of the Lord's coming. Don't try to figure it out. As a matter of fact, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Don't do it. Be alert. Live your life in self-control. Do the word of God. And don't worry because you have the hope of salvation. God hasn't appointed you unto wrath. But God has appointed you to live together with Jesus Christ who died for us. Therefore, comfort yourself with those words. Okay? Very simple. And it's a comfort. And it's our promise. And it's from 
a God who cannot lie. And there's not one Greek word you got to understand in that verse. It's that simple and it's that clear. And it ties in perfectly with the preceding chapter, chapter 4, verses forward from 13 to 18. It ties in perfectly with 1 Corinthians 15 that talks about the dead getting up, putting on incorruption, and the corrupt or, or the dead putting on immortality, and the more, more putting on immortality, and the corruptible putting on incorruption. It all fits perfectly. Perfectly. And then God gets to finish the job when he judges the earth in the book of Revelations. Specifically going from chapter 6 through 19. Because that's when the day of the Lord it starts at the gathering, but that's when the day of the Lord starts to really unfold and things start to get really bad here on the earth. Amen. So, you know, yeah, there's end times, and yeah, <coughs> we might be living in the end times, but they were living in the end times in the day of the Apostle Paul. Amen. And he said it. Okay? So don't, you know, get all flustered about this, and don't get involved with all that, let them draw you in with all these prophecies. No, no, no. They're playing in a piece of property where they shouldn't be playing. Because Acts says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Lord had put under his own power. You know what he told them then? He says, you get busy witnessing. You get busy living for me. You get busy talking to people about me. You get busy doing the word. And don't worry about when God's going to do what he's going to do. You'll know when it happens. Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, the simplicity of it, and that we can continue to learn from it and just bask in how beautiful it is and how simple it is, Father. And we don't get caught up in all these highfalutin, big words and theories, but we just take the simplicity of your truth and live that way. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you for listening to Chapter and Verse Ministry. We have newsletters, articles, podcasts, and videos posted on our website at www.cvm.church. We also post videos regularly on Rumble and on BitChute. Don't forget to like our video and to hit the bell icon if you want to know when another video is coming out. Sunlight morning when this life is over I'll fly away to my home on God's blessed shore I'll fly away I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away by and by, hallelujah in the sky, I'll fly away. I know you know this song. When those shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. I If you know it, you can sing it. Maybe this will be the glorious day. I'll fly away to a land where joy never ends. I'll fly away. You know this.
flying 